When we talk about an attempt to understand what kind of movements are developing on the far right, on the racist right, for us, it's not like a sociological exercise. You know what I mean? It's not like we're trying to get people into boxes and stuff over in order to understand them. We're trying to understand what kind of movements are developing in the world around us. You know, and sometimes people can spend, you know, we could probably spend an hour and a half discussing whether we think Donald Trump is in fact a fascist and stuff over it, right? His personal politics is one thing, but the thing about what he's trying to do, the way he relates to movements on the ground, the way he uses the state, the way he... The way he projects his power and stuff is the important thing in the same way as Bolsonaro in, 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 in Brazil and other people. So that's, so that's the nature of the discussion that we're trying to have. And the reason why we're having the discussion is the comrades just said from Austria, this, this is no longer a historical discussion. Right, that's favourite. There are real movements in Europe and in, in, the, in the States and in, in um, South America and other, other places globally and stuff that are attempting to either establish fascist movements and stuff over it right, on the basis of what happened in Germany and Italy and stuff over it during the 20s and 30s with all the different historical parallels and stuff and the way things have changed and stuff within it. And there are also a huge swathe of political movements that are being radicalised under the situations that, so, uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment. And we have to try to attempt to sort of look at how that, that they, those, things are, those things are developing because there's always been an interrelationship between what you describe as classical fascist movements and stuff over it and other racist and populist ideas and nationalist ideas and monarchist ideas and the rest of it and stuff over it. So nothing fits neatly into boxes and stuff over it. We can have like a general theoretical understanding of what we think fascism is and what fascism movements are and what they're trying to achieve and stuff over it. But what they look like on the ground and the way they relate to other social movements and stuff is really, is, is really important for us. And it's important for us because the kind of tactics you develop in order to deal with them are different from the movements. I, I hate the Tory party. I hate it. I'll take part in a picket against the Tories and stuff and the rest of it right, over it. But there's a difference between Theresa May, even at her most extreme, horrible and racist, and the fascists. Why is that? Because what the fascists want to do is they want to exterminate not just minority groupings as they call it in society, not just Muslims, not just Jews, but they want to smash the left. Rights of over it, and they want to break democracy. And there's a difference, you know, Theresa May is not the world's greatest Democrat and stuff over it, right? But at the minute, she's not trying to unleash street gangs to smash up trade union meetings on the streets and the rest of it. And that's why this stuff is important for us because when you're on a campus or when you're at work, the kind of tactics you use to relate to these people can't just be the same thing, it seems to me, if we're going to win people to work, to, to, to work with us. The biggest thing is really, is we're now 10 years into what's described as an economic crisis. 10 years into it and stuff uh, uh, over it and we've had endless austerity and what we've really got is a situation where many many political parties that have dominated since the second world war that have been in government the rest of it have disintegrated and we've got a big process of polarization going on there and it's not just to the right there is polarisation to the left. I mean, we live in a country with 600,000 people now joining the Labour Party. And Jeremy Corbyn, probably one of the most radical Labour leaders and stuff that we've, we, we've seen, whatever the ins and outs are going on around it, right? But but there is a massive period at the minute of, 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 of polarisation and also of radicalisation of, of, of political formations. And what we're seeing in Europe, it continues. I mean, you think about, you know, you can trouble with this kind of discussion is you can do a sort of tour of Europe at different stages, but you think about organisations like Five Star in Italy, that when they emerged, initially some people saw them as formations on the left. They saw them as a populist formation and stuff. They have radicalised in a right, an anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim direction, right stuff that are right or not. So UKIP is an example and stuff of a party, which Nigel Farage is a piece of dirt really and stuff over it but actually at the moment he looks like some kind of great democrat compared to Jared Batten who is now utterly trying to steer his party and stuff in relation to to far right and fascist organizations that's the relationship with Tommy Robinson Tommy Robinson is a fascist Jared Batten is trying to get people on the streets next Sunday in a way that Nigel Farage would not have dreamed of attempting to do he's somebody who likes to be wined and dined in Europe and get his money from 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 from, from, from you know from, from from the from the EU and the rest of it and so these so these processes are going at a rate of knots you even see it with the conservatives by the way Boris Johnson was a man who at one stage was a buffoon and a bit of a liberal comparatively and stuff inside the Tory party. This is the person who describes Muslim women as letterboxes and stuff. So in other words and stuff, you're getting a process where the radicalisation of, of dealing with economic crisis and stuff over, is, is, leading, is leading to this, uh, uh, this kind of polarisation and stuff. And really why, what's underpinning it is an attempt to explain the economic crisis to the mass of people. There are two explanations for why we've had 
our, our living standards have been slashed over the last 10 years. One is that bankers, politicians, etc., etc., and stuff over it have smashed up our living standards. That's one explanation, right, stuff over it, but it's not the most popular explanation, is it? The most popular explanation, really, is we are being flooded particularly in Europe, by refugees, by migrants who are undermining our, wa our wages, by people who are carrying out NHS tourism, because that's obviously what you do if you were sick, wouldn't you, and stuff around it, and, 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 most, and uh, most centrally as well, and so over it, one of the dialogues that's gone on over this thing is the role of Muslims, right, and so over it. Muslims are an enemy within. Right, so that's the dialogue and stuff over it around it, particularly since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. These people, some people undermine us economically, some people undermine us culturally. And actually, the Islamification of Europe, the idea that Muslims are, are, are playing this role in undermining Western values, etc., etc., is absolutely crucial to that, to, to that, to that kind of to that to that kind of, of 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 dialogue and you see how important islamophobia is because it's not just the extreme extreme right that use islamophobia and stuff over it right across europe and in, in the states and other places it's become a touchstone and stuff over it the opposition to the building of mosques the banning of the burqa when you think in in, in france how it's seen as a republican value right stuff i mean i people remember it a year or so ago when you have a picture of a muslim woman on a beach with two police officers standing over her with a machine gun demanding that she took off uh, you know she, she takes off her clothing on the beach and stuff sums up this kind of consensus around these around these ideas but fundamentally the idea of, of the people who rule society is it's not us we're not to blame for why your wages have been slashed by a quarter or a third over the last 10 years it's the outsiders that are the problem and that's where the concept of fortress europe essential and stuff as well in the EU and stuff like these people are flooding in and they are undermining everything we have money values etc 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 around it and it's interesting really when you think about when we talk about the term alt-right stuff over one of the terms alt-right is, is used against is a man called Steve Bannon and so everybody knows Steve Bannon your chief of staff in, in, in Trump's White House etc and now an absolutely pivotal figure on the far, the far right. Steve Bannon, somebody, anybody who ever says that you shouldn't work as, you know, on an international basis and stuff like on the left, why are you worried about this thing all the time? Steve Bannon gets it, right? So he gets the idea and stuff that you, what he's about is trying to create a movement and stuff over it. And he's described as all right. Most people, alt right, most people would describe Steve Bannon as an old fashioned fascist in many ways and stuff, 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 stuff around it. But Bannon is very interesting in the way that he puts his politics across. He tries to, he tries to explain that what Trump represented in the States and stuff over it wasn't to start simply with racism, Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, far from it. The start was to try to represent those who felt themselves as being left behind, to offer an explanation for people's lives and the way people's lives were, were, were changing as a first part of it, in order then to make, to make an opening for the racist arguments and stuff that followed in lots of ways, exactly what the comrade from Austria, what, what, the comrade from Austria was, was just talking about. The other thing alongside that is what Trump has been able to do, is Trump has been able to, uh, has, has embodied the ability to push what is acceptable, right, and stuff, to whole new levels and stuff like that. So if you think about the way things have shifted, has it started? And it's, you know, it's a marvellous way of doing it, really. Who do we start against? We start against Muslims and migrants and stuff like that. We start with a wall and we start with a Muslim ban and stuff over it. But what's come through since, right, so over that, is, old, is older forms of racism. It is now acceptable to talk about, to, to, talk, to use a kind of language, a sort of old fashioned slave language that Trump and the people around him in the Republican right have used against blacks and stuff over it. But by the way, look at the comments continually about George Soros. George Soros, Hungarian philanthropist, is now the little watchword for the international Jewish conspiracy. You want to have a go at a Jewish population? Don't say it. Just say you're against Soros. And, and Trump's thing is, is, is classically to say that some people do say that Soros plays a role, don't they? Once I'm over it. So in other words, you've got a package and stuff over it with an explanation for economic <coughs> decline, which does not blame the people at the top. It blames the people at the bottom and it blames outsiders and stuff. And, along, and, and the tagging along alongside that is, a new, is, a, is popular racism and stuff over it, starting with Islamophobia predominantly, but actually then generalising that to, 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 to other forms, to, 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 to other, other forms of, of, of racism. And actually, if you think about the debate around Brexit in this country, right and stuff over it, actually on both sides of the argument, in, in many ways with, with politicians, whether people were for leave or, or, for, or, or for remain, it was, a, it was a debate that was 
absolutely centred on racism as a concept and stuff, on attacks on migrants, on attacks on refugees, an absolutely poisonous atmosphere of which the height of which Joe Cox, a Labour MP, is shot with somebody shouting, somebody shouting Britain first at a while, at, at, when, 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 she, when, she, when she was killed and stuff over it. And that's partly when you talk about how the far right in Britain are now mobilised and stuff. I want to talk about that a little bit probably in, in, in a minute and stuff over it. You know, why is it that Tommy Robinson is coming out next Sunday over the, over the idea of Brexit betrayal when it's over it. But for Robinson, this is the kind of moment he believes and the people around him that actually when you go right back to the explanations about the emergence of Hitler and the Nazis in, Ge in Germany and stuff, they operated around the Versailles Treaty and stuff, the end of the First World War, the Isle of a Betrayal, it's a very interesting word, and now we're talking about the Brexit betrayal. Racism comes as, a, as, an, as an explanation alongside it, but it's not simply about racism for the, for the, for the far right, for the fascist right and, and, and the rest of them. It's about offering a, a, an explanation to people about the key crisis inside society and stuff over it and then and, and then and then setting a dialogue around it. See, it seems to me that, that there are very few in lots of ways of the what we would describe as, as fascist organisations in Britain, sorry, sorry in Europe and stuff over it, or, or in the States that operate openly in the in the classic picture. The classic picture we, that we've got, haven't we, is in Italy and in, uh, in, in the 1920s and in France, in, in Germany, sorry, in the 1930s, we had the black shirts, we had the SA, and these were organisations that were around fascist parties and stuff. They were popular st street movement stuff that went onto the streets, beat up the left, beat up migrants, beat up Jews and the rest of it, and they showed that they could be a tool under that basis for the people at the top of society. They could help to lower wages, they could break the unions, they could do these things, and they were basically saying, you want something done during an economic crisis, come to us, because we ain't liberals, we'll deal with these people and stuff over it. Some move, some fascist movements and stuff around, around Europe can, can look like this. I mean, classically, Golden Dawn in Greece was an organisation where half its leadership were, 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 were done for murder and stuff over in a face and a face uh, a, a, a murder trial, Jobbik in, in, in Hungary and stuff, or, or the fascists that have been leading the marches in Poland and stuff, actually a classical kind of street fighting stuff, flag waving, skinhead, um, uh, uh, um, um, developing movements and stuff. But, but it doesn't quite look like that. When you talk about Austria, we believe that, that, that the Freedom Party, the FO, are a fascist organisation, stuff over it. They emerged out of people who are ex waf and SS people inside, inside Austria and the rest of it. But at the minute, although they are in government, and stuff over it. What they haven't got is an organisation on the street. It's quite interesting. Um, a comrade who's going to speak at one of the meetings, Wayman Bennett and stuff over it, was doing a, a stall with the Austrian comrades and stuff over it, an anti-fascist stall and stuff, leafleting and stuff outside the Austrian parliament. And a number of um, like very sort of suave looking individuals come out of the parliament in nice suits and one of them wanders up to the stall and just smiles and said, when we get the chance, we will liquidate you and stuff over it. The thing of it is at the minute, the Austrian Nazis haven't got the ability and stuff to create that kind of movement at the moment, but that is what their aim is and stuff over it. But it doesn't necessarily look exactly like, a, like, classic, like classical fa fascist movements. And what, what's the reason for this? Well, there's a big reason for this really, and, and two, two major reasons. The Second World War didn't really make fascism popular and stuff over it. And so therefore, just coming out overtly as an organisation claiming your fascist heritage and stuff over it, looking back to Hitler, looking back to the Nazis and the rest of it and stuff over it, is not really a vote winner in many countries and stuff, even if other, other, other political ideas that you can put forward are. And that means and stuff over a whole period of time and stuff, people with fascist ideas have tried to develop other strategies in order to grow and develop support and stuff over it. And there have been various attempts at this and stuff, you know, the classic one and stuff, and we experienced this back in the 1980s and the 1990s and stuff, was Eurofascism an attempt to really get rid of the street movement type idea, put on suits, get yourself into the European Parliament, get yourself into your own local parliaments and, and the rest of it and stuff over it, and a, an attempt to appear to be people who are ordinary and respectable uh, and, and the rest of it. I mean, we talk about the alt-right, both in the States and in this country and stuff, you know, and, and other places. Really what you're talking about is an attempt to break out of the kind of straight jacket of a kind of, you know, what's seen as a discredited kind of fascist ideology and the rest of it, it stuff over it, and start to find new audiences and new ways of putting the ideas ac 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 across, across, even if what they do in the end is feedback into the into a, into a classic into an, a classic attempt to build a, a fascist movement. I mean, comrades from Bristol and stuff over were were were, were um, demonstrating against generation identity and stuff the, the, the other day about it. These are people actually, if you if you go on any of the demonstrations 
celebrations that Tommy Robinson has organised and stuff, you get people see Carl and the rest of it. You also get young people and stuff who, who look like anybody else on the left quite often and stuff over it will come up to you and try to debate you and stuff over it, try to take up ideas and the rest of it and stuff over it. So it's not a case and stuff that these people come in little in, in little boxes. The other reason, by the way, and stuff over it, why it's, where it's very, very difficult for people to come out openly as, as fascists, particularly in a country like Britain, is the scale of the anti-fascist movement and stuff over it. Organisations like the National Front, the British National Party, the English Defence League have been smashed and stuff over it. And that came from our anti-fascist organised and stuff uh, uh, over it, uh, uh, you know, against fascism, the anti-Nazi league back in the 1970s and the early 1990s and, and the rest of it. And so you're talking about attempts to, to develop ideology and to develop organisation under political pressure to not admit, admit your, fasc your, your fascist roots. But this has always been part of the process. Because if you think about how classical fascism developed in countries like Germany or, or, or Italy, first of all, it always had a kind of wider intellectual milieu around it and stuff like, over it. If you think about, you know, for example, and stuff in, in Germany, how, how, fascist, how the Nazi party developed, it developed in a whole milieu of, of um, what they described as volkish organisations, in other words, German cultural organisations, nationalist organisations, royalist organisations, people who supported the Kaiser, etc., etc., and stuff around. It. And what they were successful in doing, in lots of ways, was hegemonising that ideology. And stuff. What they were able to do was pull in those forces around them and stuff over. And that's why when you look at lots of the times the Nazi party, you know, classically when you see the pictures of Hitler in Lederhosen and stuff, long socks and but the rest of the stuff, what's he trying to do in those situations? They're trying to pull in those nationalist elements and stuff, people with other ide ideas uh, and, and, and stuff uh, around them. You know, in Italy and stuff, actually the Futurist Manifesto and stuff over it, elements of that and stuff over it were an, uh, were an opening up to the idea of, what, of modernism and fascism and praise of militarism and technology, right? And, stuff and the rest of it. So these aren't kind of new, particularly new processes and stuff over it. It's also always been the case, absolutely always been the case, that there's an interrelationship and an ebb and flow between fascist organisations and other groupings around them. And said so classically, in, in Nazi, what the Nazi party was able to do in Germany was over a period of time was both pulling the most radicalised elements around, around kind of German kind of cultural right wing ideas and stuff over it, but they were always uh, also able to build alliances and stuff with the conservative right and stuff over it. And it's exactly the same processes that went on in Italy. See, sometimes people believe that what, when you talk about the Nazis seizing power in Germany or Mussolini seizing power in Italy in the 1920s, that these were in some ways like revolutionary moves and stuff over it. And to be honest with you, in, what they were was exactly the opposite. What they were was a, a stage and stuff where they were able to make alliances and stuff with sections of the ruling class in order to be invited effectively into government and stuff over it. Mussolini was invited into, into government and stuff and made an alliance actually with, a, with the Italian king and stuff in order to, in order, and the government in order to go in, in, into government. Hitler was invited into government, by the way, when his, when, when his electoral support was falling and stuff around it by various alliances with nationalist organisations and the rest of it who believed that both with Mussolini and both with Hitler as well that they could hem these people in. The success of the Nazis and stuff over and the success of Mussolini and the, and the fascist movement in, in, in Italy was to do the exact opposite. They hemmed the sections of the, of, of the, of the ruling class who wanted, who wanted to work with them in. And actually when we think about what's going on at the minute about in Europe, but actually in this country, think about what's happened in the last couple of months over it. The stuff around Robinson in its own weird and wonderful way, because anybody who looks at a, a, a video of Tommy Robinson coked out of his head, talking crap at various stages and stuff <laughs> over it around, it wouldn't believe um, that he would necessarily be able to pull together much of a movement, but then again, Hitler had his off days as well, I suppose, right? Um, about it. What are they trying to do? What's over it? The big demonstrations, the big one, which was 15,000 people in Whitehall to get, you know, to free Tommy Robinson back in the summer and stuff. Who was on it? It wasn't just Nazis on that demonstration, stuff over. It wasn't just people's e garland, though they were on that demonstration. It was an organisation called the Democratic Football Lads Alliance, who were football hooligans, right wing Islamophobic football hooligans, and stuff over. It was alt right figures, the people who came up to us, the young, young activists who wanted to debate and argue and say they weren't racist, etc., etc., and stuff over it. It was international support, people like Gert Wilders, Islamophobic politicians, stuff over it, people from the Vlaams, Bock in Belgium, who are old fashioned Nazi lovers, and the rest of it, and stuff over it. But also, fundamentally as well, it was 
was UKIP. And stuff over it. It was UKIP and other those populist racists who traditionally have not gone on street marching, not dealt with the far right, it's beginning to come together. So in other words, the people around Robinson, the people around Robinson are trying to do classically what fascist movements have tried to do. They're trying to get the hardcore and stuff, the hard fascist core within it, and they're trying to get the periphery around them and pull them to the right, pull them into a harder situation and stuff over it. And this is the bit I will kind of want to, want to finish with last couple of quick things and stuff, stuff, stuff around it, because that comes back to the tactics that we use against them. One last thing it's worth saying is that we have classical examples of fascism and stuff which we'd say are Italy and Germany etc etc but there have always been governments that have either involved fascists, <coughs> have, uh, have, involved, have been, had relations with fascist street movements and stuff over it but, but are not those classical um, situations. I mean two examples that, that, that spring, spring to my mind and stuff over it, Franco's government in Spain really involved, involved the phalange, the fascists on the ground in militias and the rest of it and stuff, but actually rested on the Spanish, uh, the Spanish military. Dolphus in, Ger in Germany in, the, in, the 19, in 1934 tried to smash up the workers' movement and the rest of it, but also actually, if you think, think about it, was in some ways a sort of ra radical Catholic nationalist and stuff I, I, over it who looked more to Italy than to, Ger than, than to, than to Germany, it was eventually overthrown by, by, by Hitler and the rest of it. And so when we talk about gradations and the kind of discussions now about what does Bolsonaro's regime actually mean in Brazil and the rest of it. These debates about classification and, 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 and how, how, how I relate to them and stuff like that have gone on all, all, all the way through. Final thing to say really is, 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 is this. Like I said, that what, what do fascist movements try to do? They are trying to pull in the racist and radical right into a situation where they can create a street movement, right, stuff that can act as a battering ram, not just about against Muslims or black people or everything, stuff, whatever, but in all, effectively to break the left and to break democracy. They can be uh, irrelevant at some period of time. In periods of extreme economic crisis, they can be very useful to the people who rule our society and stuff over it. If you have to deal with mass demonstrations, strikes, protests, right, and stuff over it, unrest on the streets and the rest of it, quite often it is very useful to be able to use outside forces in order to do that. The problem with the outside forces is sometimes they get out of the box, right, and stuff over it. And if you look at Charlottesville and stuff over it and stuff and the murder of Heather Heyer and other people, you can see how the words from the top can turn into reality and stuff on, on, on the ground. So what is our main tactic to oppose this? It's one is to try to understand the processes that are going on, but fundamentally we want to break the hard minority and stuff, stuff for the hard fascist minority off from the rest of those, that, that movement. We want to make it embarrassing and difficult for somebody who has got racist ideas but isn't quite sure where they're going to go onto the streets with the likes of Robinson and the rest of it. And that's why we've always branded these people as fascists and Nazis. It's not just that sometimes words aren't important. Over this stuff, they are. Right stuff. If you're a UKIP supporter, what's the favourite? If you're somebody, whatever you voted in the referendum and stuff, who really thinks refugees or migrants are a problem, if you're worried about Muslims, etc., etc., and stuff over it, a, 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 about it, and stuff over it, and you can be a, you can be pulled in behind Robinson and, and people like Robinson, it turns them from peripheral figures into people who can really develop a movement, and that's why the strategy and tactics are so important. In the last couple of days, there's been a big row, not just about Tommy Robinson's demonstration, but how you respond to it, and there were three arguments put. First of all, a guy called Michael Chesham went into the Guardian and stuff and said that the only people who should go on the demonstration, if you want to oppose fascism, right stuff, you have to oppose Brexit. That's a favourite. So come on the demonstration. Oppose fascism, oppose Brexit. There's a little problem with that, isn't there? Half the population, or more than half the population, voted the other way. Some people voted for racist reasons, other people voted for other reasons. Personally, I voted for Brexit. I didn't vote because I'm a racist, I voted because of Fortress Europe, right, stuff over it. I voted because I think it's a boss's club, and the we can discuss that, we might disagree on that stuff over it. But if you want to force people to see Tommy Robinson and UKIP and the far right as the only champions of Brexit, that is the best way to do it. And it means half the population can't join the demo. The other thing, is it's worked out very, this actually is a happy story, it ends happily, right, it's favourite, right? The other argument, which was good yesterday, was John McDonnell goes into the, in, into the Daily Mirror and he says, it's brilliant, momentum have called a demonstration, right, stuff, so labour against racism and fascism have called a demonstration, join the demonstration, good, but there's a problem with that. 600,000 people are in the Labour Party, that's brilliant, but millions of people are not in the Labour Party. Right, so over it, uh, uh, by the way, and also we've we've seen in in France, but back you know a, a little while ago, there was a mass anti-racist organisation called SOS Racism. SOS Racism and the Socialist Party, the Labour Party in France, were like that. That was fine when the Socialist Party wasn't making cuts. As soon as they made cuts, the anti-racist movement went disintegrated. 
and stuff over it because you had to be an anti-racist and be a Labour Party supporter at the same time. So in other words, what we're for is creating an organisation that whether you're in Labour or not, whether you're for Brexit or whether you're against Brexit, right and stuff over it, if you're against racism and you're against fascism, come out together and stuff over it. So the, so the strategy and tactic stuff flow in lots of ways from our analysis of what's going on inside, inside society at the moment and the kind of movement that we want, that, that we want to try and build. So i finished, but I just think that, that like for all of us in the room, this is not an academic exercise and stuff over it. What's going to happen here and stuff over it is increasing polarisation. If you think what will happen in March in this country around Brexit, whether it actually happens or not one way or the other and stuff over it, the, the, the discourse on both sides will be poisonous and it will centre on Muslims, refugees, migrants, etc. We know that our government is completely capable of turning onto communities that have been here for gen generations. If you look at what's happened to the Windrush generation and stuff over it, it'll be racist filth. Two months later will be the EU elections. We might not have them, but at the minute it's expected that the far right in some countries can get a third of the vote or more. So sadly, we are going to be operating in interesting times. We have to be able to build an anti-racist and an anti-fascist movement that is actually capable of marginalising people. And the good thing about this country at the minute, what's the one good thing about this country? The weather's shit, everything else is shit, we know this and stuff over it. But over the last period of time, we haven't had a mass fascist movement. Why is that? Because we broke them. Because we had unity. We had a united movement that involved people on a simple thing. If you're against the fascists, you're against the racists, come together and break them. And if we have a movement that is based on division, that is disaster. That is the last thing I want to say at all. Anybody who's read these history books, why did they not stop Hitler in Germany? They didn't st there was a, a massive socialist party, Labour Party in Germany. There was a massive communist radical party and stuff over it. And there were millions of people in the trade unions. Why didn't they stop him? Yes, they didn't stop. I'll tell you why they didn't stop him. I, I don't think it wasn't the power of the, the right. It's because they refused to unite with each other. They started out from what divided them and they stayed with what divided them until they were in the concentration camps where they still argued with each other that they were each to blame for the reason, right, stuff, why Hitler came to power, right, stuff, until they were executed and off they went. That is not a happy story, right, stuff over it. There's one thing you have to do to stop the growth of the far right and to stop the fascist is to have unity. Anybody who tries to start from the point of division is playing the other side's game. That's the truth there. And we've got to have a hard argument about that because we can always find things on the left that divide us. And stuff like we, we've probably got a million and one different opinions, different opinions in the room and stuff over it. We can have arguments and the rest of it and stuff over it, right? But they don't care. There's a quote from Trotsky which says, work a communist. If you don't unite with the social democrats, the fascists will go over, will go over your skulls like a great tank. Right, stuff over it. And that's what people like Robinson want to do. And we can be the, have to be the people at the heart of it who argue unity, unity, unity. We can argue alongside it, we can discuss and debate, but when it comes down to it, you link arms and you stop those fuckers coming through. And we want to do that next Sunday as well.